Um, yeah, okay. So um, yeah, Chris, thank you very much for, um, for the invitation. Um, it, yeah, it's my, my honor to, to, to give this, uh, this mini course. Um, yeah, I also apologize for, for, for not being, uh, being there in person, but please, I just wanna encourage people to, uh, well, of course, ask questions during the talk, but also feel free to uh, email me um, if you have um, questions outside of, outside of that. Um, yeah, so I guess the, the purpose of my, um, what I was planning for my mini course was to, to, to talk about uh, some results on uh, uh, symptomic cohomology. Um, so symptomic cohomology, uh, I guess, was uh, originally defined uh, in work of Fontaine Messing and Kato, and so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about their work uh, during the mini course. Uh, but that, so, so in their definition, they, they give something that's, uh, that, that works sort of up to isogeny. It doesn't quite give the, the right integral theory in all weights. Uh, and more recently, so, so thanks to the development of prismatic cohomology, there's, there's really the, the, the integral theory of symptomic cohomology has, has been developed. So, so I wanted to, in these lectures, I wanted to talk about this, this integral version of symptomic cohomology um, and explain some results uh, about it. Um, okay, so let me start by just sort of describing the format of this theory. So, uh, right, so let X be a scheme. Uh, so then uh, in this work, so, so in this work of Bad Marosholza and Bad Lurie, uh, they define some objects. So then there are symptomic complexes that what well, they call symptomic complexes that you can associate to X. Uh, and I'll write this as R gamma sin of X with coefficients of ZP of I. Uh, I'll also write this as ZP of I of X. Uh, and this is going to be some, some object in the p-complete derived category of ZP. Uh, and I guess this is for all integers i. I guess I'll focus on i greater than or equal to zero. Um, and this is called the i-th symptomic complex of x. And somehow the philosophy is that these, these symptomic complexes are, are supposed to give um, a theory of p-adic et al motivic cohomology uh, that works for any, any scheme. So a heuristic is that these symptomic complexes are, are, are p-adic et al motivic complexes. Uh, in such a way that they're defined for, for arbitrary schemes. So, so in you know, these are classical approaches to motivic cohomology, for example, based on uh, based on algebraic cycles or, or higher child groups, they're usually defined in the in the smooth case. Um, and uh, but somehow the definition of, of the symptomic complexes does not go through algebraic cycles. It's something that we can define for any scheme. Um, but it's supposed to be an approach to at least the atomic sheet provocation of uh, peak completion of the motivic complexes. Um, right, so in, in particular, uh, what does this mean? This means that the symptomic complexes should be sort of a home for term classes. So for example, this means that, uh, uh, you know, this heuristic means that uh, given a vector bundle, uh, then one has term classes. Uh, Ci, which live in H2I, uh, symptomic cohomology with weight I. So, so the i symptomic complex is, is, is in particular, it's a home for the i term class uh, of a vector bond. Um, so yeah, so before I uh, sort of start into definitions, let me, let me just give a couple of examples. Um, right, so maybe I should also say, so uh, site variant is that so that will also be useful for, um, for the lectures, is that we can globalize ZP of I. So I said that ZP of I is some, some p-complete complex that we associate to X. But if we work with mod P to the N coefficients, we can globalize this in the et al topology. So we can globalize the construction. And yeah, let me do this with mod P to the N coefficients. Uh, and this is going to produce an object 
which I'm going to write as z mod p to the n twisted by i sub x. And this is living in the derived category of et al. sheaves on x with z mod p to the n coefficients. Um, and right, so by definition, uh, z mod p to the n phi of x, the i syntomic complex of x mod p to the n is the et al. hyperchromology of this complex. Um, so in the first lecture, I guess I, yeah, I wanted to try to in particular define these objects, but let me let me start with sort of two two basic examples uh, to keep in mind where I guess these objects have been considered um, uh, in earlier uh, earlier work. So the first example is that if you have a z-adjoin one over p scheme, then the syntomic complex uh, is the uh, is the usual Tate twist. So if x lives over z-adjoin one over p, then z p of i of x is exactly the cohomology, well, let's say pro-etal cohomology of x with coefficients in the, the usual Tate twist to p of i. Um, so in other words, z mod p to the n uh, twisted by i sub x uh, is, is precisely the sheaf mu p to the n tensor i. So in general, the syntomic, the syntomic complexes, so if I write it as z mod p to the n twisted by i sub x, they always restrict on the locus where you've inverted p to um, um, to the usual Tate twists. So maybe I should just write that. So in general, for any x, um, right. And so also this, I guess, this makes sense if, if, if you're thinking in terms of the homology or turn classes, because the, the ith turn class will, will live in this in this Tate twist. So, so, so this is the theory over, over schemes where, where P is invertible. Um, and so, yeah, so in, in, in particular, what's uh, sort of new is, is, is gonna be really happening in, in positive or mixed characteristic. Um, and let me give uh, one example in positive characteristic where these, these objects have been considered before. Um, so if X is, is now an FP scheme and it's a regular FP scheme, uh, then, uh, then this object Z mod p to the n twisted by i sub x uh, is, uh, is this logarithmic Durand-Witt uh, uh, logarithmic Durand-Witt forms. So it's given by um, uh, wn omega i log sub x uh, and then with a shift by minus i. Uh, so uh, I'll say a little bit about this object, but so, so, so this was originally considered for n equals one by Milne uh, and then in general by UC. Uh, and also studied by uh, Gro. Uh, right. So, 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 for example, um, right. So, so, so explicitly, this is this is the subsheaf. So, this W n omega i log is a subsheaf um, of the nth Durand-Witt forms, Durand-Witt i forms, that's generated by uh, sort of d log forms. Um, and uh, as an example, sort of sub example, uh, this means that if you, if you work with mod p coefficients, so so f p of i sub x. Uh, it's the it's the kernel of well you take i forms on x, and then you map that to i forms on x modulo boundaries uh, via the map which is one minus the inverse Cartier operator, and then you shift by minus i. So as a complex of sheaves in the Atal topology, well actually this so, yeah so this is uh, this map is surjective, so, so 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 what you get in the Atal topology is, is, is literally uh, a sheaf uh, shifted by by minus i. Uh, and so yeah, so in particular, this also means that uh, if you do this with p-adic coefficients, then the z p of i of x is given by the the fiber of one minus f on uh, the logarithmic or sorry on the the Durand bit i forms. Okay, so, 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 so these are two examples where the symptomic complexes have been, have been considered previously uh, in all weights. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, so sorry, so any, any questions so far? Okay, so, so the next thing I wanted to do is to, to describe uh, the definition of the symptomic complexes in all weights for, um, 
uh, which is based on K theory. Uh, sorry, so there's, there's a question. So the, a question uh, on Zoom from uh, from Arthur Otis. Yeah, I just wanted, it seems like in these last cases, you actually have a complex that you could work with. I know that's something Spencer Block's pretty enthusiastic about his theory, but in the original cases, you were just having object in the derived category or, or maybe some infinity category. Uh, how often do you actually have complexes you can work with? Um, yeah, it's a good question. When is there sort of an explicit complex? Right. Um, yeah, so I, I, I guess, right, so in, in um, I think one example is that if, if you're if you're over OC, there are these Q to ROM complexes that can explicitly write down the AM cohomology. Mm -hmm. And so then I think you could write down the the asymptomic complexes if if you have something like formally smooth over OC and you choose coordinates using the Q to ROM complex, um, which I guess is how Batmore and Schultz to, to approach them. Um, I'm not sure that it's going to be so explicit. So, so yeah, I, I will give some examples of the asymptomic complex, so I'm not sure. It's going to be quite as explicit and as like an sort of chain complex. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Okay, so so the next thing I wanted to so 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 yes, yeah, so in this first lecture, I wanted to give the, the definition of the symptomic complexes in general, following the work of these authors. Um, and, and this definition is somehow purely algebraic, but I wanted to start by by giving um, so, so so the purely algebraic definition involves a little bit of booing. And wanted to start by giving a very uh, direct definition of the symptomic complexes uh, via K theory. Uh, and this definition is uh, due to Nizio. So, so the next thing I wanted to do is to describe the K theoretic definition. Of the symptomic complexes. And this is due to Nizio. Um, yeah, so I should say that I will not use this case theoretic definition for the rest of the lectures, but uh, since it's a, a very direct definition, I wanted to sort of explain this. Um, okay, so so let me just recall first recall some facts about K theory. So so construction. So if X is a quasi-projective scheme over some ring, uh, so then one defines K zero of X to be the Grotendieck group of vector bundles on X. Uh, so in other words, it's it's uh, it's it's a group defined by generators and relations. So you have a generator brackets v for v a vector bundle, uh, and you have the relation brackets v is equal to brackets v prime plus brackets v double prime if there exists a short exact sequence zero to v prime, sorry zero to v prime to v to v double prime to zero. Um, so, so this defines uh, K0 uh, of, of the quasi-projective scheme. Um, and then, yeah, thanks to the work of, of, of many people, in particular Krillin, Volthausen, and Thomason, and Trebeau, um, there are also higher groups. So there is a construction of higher groups. Ki of x, and let me say for i greater than or equal to zero, uh, which is roughly based on, an, I guess, an animation of this type of construction. So somehow this is an animation, in some sense, of the construction of K0. So I, I will not try to define formally higher K theory in, in, in these lectures, but essentially it's, it's defined by, by some sort of homotopical version of this, this K0 construction, where you consider not only isomorphism classes of vector bundles, but you consider the anima or the groupoid of vector bundles and you, you allow longer filtrations and well. So okay, so 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 there is some some, some theory of, of higher K groups, uh, and these arise as, as the homotopy groups of a space or an anima called the K theory, uh, K theory anima of X, which is which is some sort of yeah, animated version of, of K0. Um and um, right. And so I want to consider the following construction. So um, there, there are k groups, not only uh, sort of integral k groups, but k groups with torsion coefficients. So you can consider the k groups of x, say, with z mod p coefficients or z mod p to the n coefficients. Um, and so these, these are going to define um, these are going to define presheaves on on the category of schemes.
uh, well, because K theory is functorial, the, the pullback of, of effector bundles. Um, and then the construction is we can, we can take the Rital sheafification. So consider the, the higher K groups with mod P to the N coefficients and, uh, and take the Rital sheafification. Um, and then there's the following there's the following theorem, which is due to Gabber and Susan, that describes them complete this construction completely in the case of Zima, uh, in the case of Zia join one of our T schemes. So there's the following um, uh, theorem of Gabber and Susan, which states that on Zia join one of our T schemes. Well, we have the following facts. So first of all, if you take the odd k groups with mod p to the n coefficients and a tall sheet of phi, you get zero. And if you take the even k groups with mod p to the n coefficients and a tall sheet of phi, you get exactly mu p to the n tensor up. Um, so in general, k theory is somehow very, k groups are somehow very difficult to compute. Uh, and they will look very different for different schemes. But what's really remarkable about this theorem is that when you work with mod p to the n coefficients and sheafify with the in the Atel topology on zero join one over p schemes, you sort of get a uniform answer, and you get exactly these these take choice um, mu p to the n tensor i. Um, so in particular, um, in particular, uh, part one is saying that if you have an odd degree uh, uh, k theory class with mod p to the n coefficients on a zero join one over p scheme, you can always annihilate that class. Upon passage to an Intel cover. Um, so yeah, so this theorem is not true in uh, for for arbitrary schemes. So it's not true. Uh, but but there is a construction. But there, it, it, so it, for example, it's it's not true for arbitrary schemes because uh, already it's not true with K, for K one with Zimov P to the n coefficients. So K one is roughly. Uh, is roughly units. And then the issue is that you can't sort of take p roots uh, in the atal topology of units even, um, uh, unless you're working over z join one over p. Um, so the strategy is, but somehow there is a similar picture if you work not with the atal topology, but with the symptomic topology. So the strategy is to work with the symptomic topology uh, So this is generated by, um, uh, faithfully flat LCI covers. So, so this is the topology which is generated by faithfully flat LCI morphisms. And in particular, in this topology, you're allowed to do things like take p-throughs, really add solutions to any sort of non problem. Um, yeah, and so then there's the following uh, theorem. So uh, I'll give the attribution in just a second. So it states that, okay, sorry. So first let me get the definition. So, so you can consider the K groups uh, sheafified in the symptomic topology. So consider the K groups with mod P to the N coefficients uh, and sheafified in the symptomic topology. Um, and then, so there's the following Akil, theorem. Akil, could you yes. move a little bit uh, so we don't see what you write? You should move it a little bit. Uh, sorry, move my screen? Yes, it's blocked. Yeah, it's okay. Is it okay now? Sorry, is it, is it okay now? Sorry, I can't hear. It's okay. It's okay. All right. Okay. So um, yeah. So so the theorem is that on on the category of LCI Noetherian schemes, there's an analog of part one of of, of the gabber susan theorem. So in other words, the odd degree K groups, uh, symptomic sheafified, uh, vanish for i greater than or equal to zero. 
So in other words, if you have an odd degree K class in uh, with mod P to the N coefficients on an LCI scheme, you can always find some symptomic cover that annihilates that class. So this theorem, right, so this theorem is proved in a slightly different form uh, by Bott and Schultz and their, so this is called, I guess, called the odd vanishing theorem and it's proved by Bott and Schultz and their PRISMS uh, paper. Uh, but let me also add Sosnovikos uh, and Schultz. Um, uh, because, because they're using, be, for, for a strengthened form of Andre's lemma that, they're, uh, they're, that goes into, into proving this. And also the work of Bottmore or Schultz is somehow being used um, uh, in this. Okay, so, so, so there's an analog of part, um, so there's an analog of, of part one of the gaber system theorem. And uh, part two is gonna be a little bit more complicated. There's not gonna be sort of a uniform description uh, of, of the symptomic uh, chiefifications of the even K groups, but you can at least consider it. So you can consider, so again, on LCI and Ethereum schemes, the even K groups symptomic chiefified with mod P to the N coefficients. And this is going to give you some sheaf on the symptomic site. And then you can take the derived push forward to the at all site. So this is a sheaf of D mod P to the N um, modules on, on the symptomic site and take the push forward to the at all site, the small at all site of a given scheme. So where X is LCI and well, in fact, that is exactly z mod p to the n twisted by i sub x. Um, so this gives a very direct construction of, of the asymptomic complexes. Um, and you know, this can be a definition. Um, this is a definition in terms of, in terms of the language of K-theory. Uh, but it, yeah, so, so I, I, it's a very direct definition that, that works sort of uniformly, um, but I will also give an algebraic definition. So the algebraic definition goes through prismatic homology, but uh, in fact, there's this direct definition uh, via K theory. Okay. So, so, so now let me give the, the, the description, uh, the, the approach, let me sketch the approach to symptomic homology by Fontaine Messing and Kato. So um, right. So so in the algebraic approach to symptomic homology, the idea is that there's a there's an approach there's a there's a definition that there's a definition of the symptomic homology of a p-adic formal scheme, uh, and then there's sort of a, a map to the atal homology of the rigid generic fiber, and then you define the symptomic homology of an arbitrary scheme by by sort of looping. Um, and the first so so, so really what happens uh, is is happening on on the p-adic completion and, and it's on the theory for for formal schemes. Um, and this is something that was first, yeah, first defined by uh, Fontaine Messing and Kato, and they give a definition that works sort of up to um, uh, up to isogeny or or in low weights. So, so, so the next thing I wanted to do is to to, to recall some uh, some of their work. So let X uh, be a p-adic formal scheme. Uh, and let me assume for simplicity that it's smooth over spot CP. So then we can consider the, the piadic Durham complex of X. So we can consider R gamma Durham of X. Uh, and I feel like this is the right, so this is the P completion of, of the algebraic Durham of the algebraic Durham complex of X. Um, right, and so, so, so this, this, this theory is, uh, is equipped with sort of two pieces of structure. So this uh, piadic derived p homology is equipped with the following two pieces of structure. Uh, so first of all, it's equipped with a Hodge filtration. So R gamma Durham greater than or equal to I of X. Well, this is, this is sort of 
At the level of complexes, it's a naive filtration where you take I forms and, and up. So naive filtration. Uh, and it's equipped with a, a Frobenius operator. And the Frobenius operator comes from the crystalline theory because the Durham complex is the crystalline, is also the crystalline cohomology of the special fiber, and the special fiber has Frobenius, so that gives um, a Frobenius here. Uh, so yeah, so the Hodge filtration does not depend, is not a functor of the, of the special fiber. Um, okay, so then there's the following definition. So, uh, so this is the definition of yeah, front end massing and, and Kato. Um, uh, right. So let me call the ZP of I Chris of X. And it's the fiber. Well, somehow you take these two pieces of structure under account. So it's the fiber of uh, Frobenius minus P to the I, which goes from R gamma Durham of X uh, greater than or equal to I and the ith Hodge filtration into R gamma Durham of X. So for I greater than or equal to zero. Um, so yeah, so somehow it's it's picking out classes in the uh, in the drum in in the piatic drum cohomology, which well first of all they live in Hodge filtration at least i, and uh, somehow their phi equals p to the i eigenspaces uh, for the Frobenius. And the motivation, well one piece of motivation for this kind of construction, is that if v is a vector bundle on x, then you can define the turn classes of x as uh, turn classes of v. Uh, in the in the Durham in the Durham complex, and then the observation is that they live in filtration. They, they simultaneously live in filtration at least i in the Hodge filtration, and their e equals p to the i eigenspaces. Uh, so in particular, they lift it to this construction. Um, okay, so so that's part of maybe part of the motivation uh, of this of this construction, and this construction gives you uh, it gives you a good theory sort of up to isogeny. So um, there's the following construction uh, to the Fontaine and Messing. Uh, sorry, so I should say that you can generalize this construction. Let's say to flat LCI schemes, flat LCI piatic form schemes, uh, where again you would use sort of the crystal inversion of the Hodge filtration, uh, or you could say it's using piatic derived Durham cohomology. Um, okay, and so there's the following construction, which is that if X is X is as above, so it's a piatic formal scheme, there's a natural map. Up to isogeny. Well, so that, by that I mean some some multiple of p times this map is defined, uh, and it goes to z p. It goes from z p of i Chris of x to z p of i of x adjoint one over p. And uh, by the right hand side, I mean the uh, the Atel cohomology of the rigid generic fiber. Yeah, so this is this is called a this is called a, a piatic period map in the literature, and it's been used to, for example, to prove uh, comparison results. I think part of the motivation was to prove uh, comparison results in piatic Hodge theory, uh, because it gives a way of of somehow relating the the Durham Durham cohomology uh, of X and uh, the Atal cohomology of the generic fiber, because the the, the left hand side is somehow defined in terms of the Durham cohomology to, or crystalline cohomology together with its natural structure. And the, the right hand side is the Atal cohomology. Um, so th this gives sort of a, a purely local way of, of relating these, uh, these two data. Um, and in fact, 
another feature is that this map is often uh, itself an isogeny at, sort of in a range of degrees. So there's the following theorem, which is due to Kurihara, Kato, Suji, and Kolmes Misio. Uh, and it states that if, if X is formally smooth or semi-stable, over OK or OK bar or K a piadic field, Uh, then this map is, is, is actually an isogeny in degrees less than i. Uh, so this map from the, the, the sort of crystalline syntomic cohomology to the etel cohomology of, of the generic fiber is, is an isogeny uh, in degrees at most i. Uh, and so, for example, this implies the following corollary due to Colmez and Uziel. Uh, so let me assume for simplicity x over OK is formally smooth. Uh, then there's a natural isomorphism. So if j is less than or equal to i minus 1, there's a natural isomorphism. Between the Durand cohomology uh, of x, so that uh, where you've inverted p, so for k, is the same thing as hj proletal of the rigid generic fiber with coefficients in qp of n. So I guess this will follow from um, from using um, from using this theorem and, and and sort of identifying the left hand side a little bit more explicitly in this case. Yeah, so, so essentially I wanted to talk about some sort of generalizations of, um, of, of, of this theorem. Um, yeah, so, 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 so just going back to this definition of syntomic cohomology, this, this definition of syntomic cohomology does not quite give the right theory integrally. So for example, it does not, it's not gonna agree with the, the K-theoretic definition that is sketched above integrally. And um, right, um, there, there are some denominators that are being introduced by this procedure and let me just maybe make a remark, which is that you can, you can you can get an integral theory in low weights using using this approach. So a remark is that, and so this appears in paper of Kato. So if i is less than or equal to p minus two, then you can sort of improve um, the above definition by uh, considering a divided Frobenius. So then, if you consider the Frobenius from r gamma greater than or equal to i Durham of x to r gamma Durham of x, then this map is canonically divisible by p to the i. So the Frobenius makes is naturally divisible by p to the i on the i stage of the Hodge filtration. Sort of canonically divisible by p to the i. And so you can consider, ins consider instead um, Sort of the fiber of this divided Frobenius, so fiber of one minus phi divided by p to the i, which goes from r gamma Durham greater than or equal to i of x to r gamma Durham of x. And so this is this is a more refined thing and a more refined construction, and it gives you the correct sort of integral theory in, in these weights. Uh, right, but somehow this isn't going to work. Uh, this isn't going to work at all weights because the the Frobenius because this sort of divisible divisibility by p to the i isn't isn't going to work in general. The Hodge filtration is not sort of defined such that Frobenius makes it divisible by by p to the i for larger i. Um, so somehow the idea is that is a prismatic cohomology allows for an integral version of this theory, and the reason is that well, first of all, well, the format is somehow that you replace in the above construction, you, you replace the ROM cohomology with prismatic cohomology, you replace the Hodge filtration with the Nygaard filtration, and the Nygaard filtration really is defined so that Frobenius becomes divisible to the right extent on the Nygaard filtration. 
Um, and so, so, so this lets you define the, the theory of symptomic homology in, in, in all the sensor code. Uh, one sort of caveat is that also you're not dividing by P, you're somehow dividing by the prismatic ideal. And in order to do that, one also has to introduce these Broca's and twists that one doesn't have in um, over here. So, okay. So first goal is is to define the integral theory. And again, this is following the work of Butler or Schultz and so Butler. Okay, so so um, so I want to give the, the integral definition of the ZP advice, and it'll be convenient to use this uh, um, this this tool called the quasi syntomic site. Uh, so this was introduced by by Bart Moore and Schultz of BMS two in their their article on THH and integral piatic clutch theory, and this is going to be well some sort of replacement of the syntomic topology, but that is a little bit more convenient for these things, some version of the pro syntomic topology. Okay, so let me give, make the following definition. And this is, again, this is due to Bob Morrow Schultz, I'll abbreviate to BMS2. Um, so a ring R is quasi symptomic if it has the following properties. So, first of all, R is P complete with bounded P power torsion. Uh, and second of all, if I take the cotangent complex of R over Z and form the derived tensor product over R with R mod P, so this is living in the derived category of R mod P modules, this has Tor amplitude uh, in degrees minus one to zero. Uh, and I guess I'm using cohomological uh, conventions here. Um, and so I'll let Q set be the category of quasi symptomic rings. So uh, furthermore, QSIN has a structure of a site, or rather I should say QSIN op has the structure of a site. Site. So given a map A to B in Q sin, we'll say that it's a cover uh, if the following holds. So, so first of all, the map from A mod P to B derived tensor product over A with A mod P is faithfully flat. So in particular, the target is required to be discrete. So the target is just in degree zero. Um, so this, uh, I guess this is called P-complete faithful flatness by, um, by BMS2. Uh, and second, the requirement is that when you take the cotangent complex of B over A and derive tensor with B over B with B mod P, this produces an object in the derived category of B mod P, and this should have Tor amplitude in minus one zero. So this is the notion of a cover in, in Q. Okay, so, so essentially the idea is that this is supposed to be a non-Ethereum analog of, of the topology that I was mentioning earlier, which was the symptomic topology on the category of LCI Ethereum schemes. So remark is that if R is an Ethereum, if R is P-complete Ethereum, then R is quasi-symptomic uh, if and only if it's an LC, if, if and only if it's LCI. So quasi syntomic rings are, are some generalization of, of LCI and Ethereum rings. And the quasi syntomic topology is some sort of generalization of the syntomic topology where you're allowing, but where you're allowing sort of, for example, you're allowing filtered colimits of, of covers to be, to, to remain covers. 
So in particular, any so in particular, any faithfully flat symptomic map is going to be uh, a cover in in, in QSIM. Um, and yeah, so a key feature of the quasi symptomic topology is that you can always add lots of p power roots. So so example, if R is in QSIM, and if T is an element of R, then you can consider R adjoin x to the one over p to the infinity modulo x minus t, and everything is p-completed, and this is a quasi-symptomic cover of R. And so we've added a compatible system of p-power roots of t. Um, so furthermore, QSEN has a nice basis. So there's a nice basis. So we'll say that R is quasi-regular semi-perfectoid. If R belongs to QSIM and R is a quotient of a perfectoid ring. So I'll write QR as perfect to be the category of quasi-regular semi-perfectoid rings. Um, so this is a basis for the quasi-syntomic topology because if you have something, in, if you have a quasi-syntomic ring, you can add tons of p-power roots and, and that's going to be quasi-regular semi-perfectoid. But yeah, so the basic example is if you have a perfectoid ring and you mod if you quotient by a regular sequence, then that's going to be quasi regular semi perfectoid. Yeah, so so this this quasi symptomic site will somehow be a useful sort of formalism for uh, for defining the symptomic symptomic complexes. Because essentially the idea is that they're going to be the symptomic complexes. Uh, so if p-adic formal schemes are going to be sheaves on the quasi-symptomic site, and because uh, there's a basis, then you can define it. Um, well. We have a question. Yeah, we have a question. So uh, I'm uh, just a very technical question. On uh, you, you have this uh, bounded torsion assumption, and in the last example, you take a perfectoid modulo a regular sequence, mm -hmm. and I wonder if this bounded torsion is automatic, maybe not. Um, that's a good question, thanks. So let, let me, let me, I'm not completely sure offhand, so let me, let me add that. Thank you. And so another uh, obvious thing is that you probably also want to have the risky, finite the risky covers in your side, namely not only covering by one object, or, but also the usual the risky covers. But maybe it will not change uh, much because you can always take the ring, I mean. Right, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I mean, I also I want to, yeah. So I mean, I also want to assume like, you know, products of, so, so sure. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, yeah. So, so um, right. So the strategy is that all of these these constructions, like syntomic complexes, are going to be sheaves on QSIN. and in particular, that means because there's this basis QRS perf that they can be recovered from from the value on QRS perf. And on QRS perf, they're going to have a pretty sort of explicit description. So the strategy is to define everything by descent from QRS perf. Okay, so in particular, this it will be convenient to define absolute prismatic cohomology and its sort of natural structures via descent from QRS perf. So I think I have 15 minutes, so we'll, we can do that. So. Okay, so um, okay, so there's the following construction. 
So let R be a quasi-regular semi-perfectoid ring. Um, so then we can associate the following. Uh, yeah, so we can associate the following data. So can construct, first of all, we can construct the absolute prismatic uh, complex. Absolute prismatic homology uh, prism of R. And this is this is this is uh, in general prismatic homology is living in the derived category, but here this is just a ring. Um, so here prism of R together with phi comma i is a prism in the sense of Bob and Schulze. Uh, and there's a map from R to prism of R mod i. And in fact, prism of R, it, it's a universal prism with, with such a map. So if you like, that's the definition. Um, okay, and so that there's some additional structure on uh, on this uh, on this object, uh, so on this prism of R, which um, again this universal prism. So in particular, there's the Nygaard filtration. So this is a descending multiplicative filtration on this ring prism of R. So n greater than or equal to star of prism of R is exactly it's going to be exactly those. Uh, those elements in prism of R such that Frobenius makes them divisible by that power of the ideal. So it's phi inverse of the powers of R. So again, this is something that works sort of nicely in the prismatic setting because uh, so it, didn't, it kind of worked in low in, yeah. So this is something that works very well in the prismatic setting um, for, de for defining things like um, the divided um, prismatic divided Frobenius. Um, so next one has a has a Broichism twist. So there's an invertible, sort of a natural invertible prism of R module. Sorry. Uh, which is called a Broichism twist. And in fact, this is a construction that one can do for any prism. Uh, so whenever you have a prism, this is invertible module called the break and twist. Uh, and this, this invertible module has itself a sort of Frobenius. So, so remember, prism of R has a Frobenius, it's a, uh, it's a prism. Uh, but there's sort of a sort of meromorphic Frobenius on prism of R twisted by one. So there is a phi linear map, which, go, which I'll call phi one, which goes from prism of R twisted by one to I inverse times prism of R just to go. Uh, and uh, the key feature is that the phi linearization is an isomorphism. And so then we have, uh, right. and so another uh, object that we can extract. So I'll just write this notation. So prism of R bar is going to be prism of R mod I. And this is called a Hodge tape cohomology. And in practice, this is often sort of easier to access because it receives a map from R. Uh, and furthermore, this, this, these Broichus and twists become a little bit simpler over, uh, over Hodge tape homology. So if you take prism of R twisted by one, uh, and if you tensor over prism of R with prism of R bar, uh, it's exactly the invertible prism of R module, prism bar of R module given by I mod I square. Um, so just for future reference, uh, so from the way, so since this is going to be used later, um, if we think about if we think about the definition of the Nygaard filtration and uh, the iatic filtration, uh, so the, the prismatic Frobenius induces a filtered map, which goes from n greater than or equal to star of prism of R 
to the aortic filtration on present afar and on associated greater terms. We get a map of graded rings from the direct sum of n n i prism far. So this is the i stage of the Nygaard filtration, mapping to the direct sum of we could even say greater than or equal to zero of uh, of prism of r bar just to that i. So this is i to the I mod i to the i plus one. And so this map will play a role in the sequel side. So sure okay, so these, these are all some general constructions that come from the prismatic formalism. And the idea is that they're, they're literally you know, maps of rings or module, you know, graded rings, et cetera, uh, for QRSP rings. And then you can descend to QSIN to get, to get sort of complexes. So can descend. Right, sorry, I guess I should say that they are um, sheaves on QRS Bert and so sort of, sort of, yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, there's a question. From no, no, don't, is it the direct sum of the NI prism of R, is that what you mean? Or you mean the GUR, NI modulo NI plus one on the left side there? Uh, sorry, so, yeah, so NI meaning GUR I. GUR I, because NI before had a different meaning. So okay, I think I was so, using uh, N greater than or equal to I in my notation. But oh, okay, anyway, I'm sorry. Yeah, right. sorry. Yeah, thanks for also, can you be any more explicit about about this this universal prism? You you describe it as having a universal property. Can you can mm -hmm. you say more about what it really looks like? Um. Well, I mean, sorry. So this this universal prism. So it's yeah. Can it's you can the, you say yeah. more what it looks like explicitly? Is that impossible? Well, I mean, I think I mean in this like prisms uh, paper, they 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 sort of describe this in terms. Of, so 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 if your ring R is like a perfectoid module of some regular sequence, then you can describe it in terms of these prismatic envelopes. But mm -hmm. I, I think it will be, I mean, as a ring, it will be somewhat complicated. So for an FP algebra, this this prism of R is is exactly a cross. So if you have a quasi-regular semi-perfect FP algebra, then prism of R is exactly a cross. And this is some sort of mixed characteristic analog of that. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so question. Again, so in the notation, in the notation of the prism, you put phi, which is mm -hmm. a Frobenius, instead of this delta structure that, of course, it giving them is equivalent if there is no p torsion. So is it in yes. this case that there is no p torsion in this construction or? Uh, that is also a good question. I think I'm not sure offhand. So in fact, okay, so in fact, I should say, and actually I think this is how we wrote it in the paper, we can just consider this all for p torsion free. We can just restrict to the case where r is p torsion free and then prism of r is p torsion free. So let me just make a remark. So suffices for actually sort of you know, setting this up, suffices to consider only p torsion free things. Um, and then the reason is that you can, anyway, everything is going to be defined by left con extension. So, so, so the strategy is somehow you, you define it on these quasi symptomic things, and then you left con extend to more singular things. And so if you wanted, you could start with the P torsion free case and yeah. And so then there's really no issue. So, and is it the case that this kind of satisfies uh, is cheap and satisfies in the cohomological sense So everything set on the category of those uh, uh, quasi I mean, qua uh, semi-perfect with the uh, quasi that you define, that you have cohomological descent for all those constructions? Yes. So, yeah. So, uh, thank you. I, I, I should write that. So, let me, let me write that. So, because B above define sheaves on QRS perfect with no higher cohomology. Or sheaves in that more typical sense. And this somehow, I mean, it all sort of boils down to these uh, controlling everything in terms of the cotangent complex and using that the cotangent complex uh, is a sheath in the, in the homotopical sense. And all of these constructions on QRSP rings can be 
well, by the Hodge shape comparison, they're filtered in terms of the cotangent complex and the wedge powers. Yeah, but thank you. That's a that's an important point. Um, okay. Yeah. So 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 maybe also yeah. Technically, it's also worth saying that in setting this up, you can it would actually be suffice. It would be sufficient to to just work with p torsion free rings and and um, yeah. And, and so in that case, you would you would get not just a prism, but you would get a transversal prism. Uh, so that means that prism of bar bar is p torsion free. And therefore, prism of R itself is Peter Trump here. Um, okay, so I just have a couple of minutes left. So, 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 so maybe I should, um, yeah, so maybe I should actually give the definition of symptomic um, cohomology. Um, right, maybe let me just say one example. So maybe one key example is if R is actually perfectoid. Uh, right, so then in that case, prism of R is a n for four. Uh, and uh, the map from R to prism bar of R uh, is an isomorphism. Um, and the inverse comes from the map theta, which goes from a n for four. Okay, so, so, so now let me give the definition of symptomic cohomology and then I guess uh, we'll stop. Um, so again, this is going to be a definition for on Q sin, and in fact, it will infer, in fact, for all P complete rings, but let me start by defining on, on QRS perfed. So let R be in QRS perfed. So then the definition is that, uh, well, so we're going to consider the eighth Broekus and twist of a uh, prism of R. And this comes with a, a meromorphic for Vanius phi sub i, which goes to i, i to the minus i of prism of R twisted by i. So it has this sort of for Vanius with denominators. And now, well, by construction of the Nygaard filtration, uh, it carries n greater than or equal to i of prism of R twisted by i. So it carries the multiples of the i stage of the Nygaard filtration into just into prism of R twisted by i. Because, the, because, of, because it's a phi linear map and phi makes phi is divisible by the ith power of the prismatic ideal on the, on the Nygaard filtration. So the definition is that z p of i of R is going to be the fiber of phi sub i minus the sort of canonical inclusion map from n greater than or equal to i times prism of r twisted by i to prism of r twisted by i. And yeah, just to, just to clarify, when I say n greater than or equal to i prism of r twisted by i, I mean n greater than or equal to i of prism of r times prism of r so this is an explicit sort of two-term complex of, of abelian groups on uh, QRS. Right. Um, and then, so by descent, one can define it on Z P of I of R for all R in Q sin. And then by animation, so uh, I can say a little bit more about this in the next session, uh, but by animation, or left, con left con extension, it's going to extend to all P complete animated rings. Okay, so this is the definition of the symptomic complex for uh, for p-adic formal schemes. And since I'm out of time, maybe I'll stop here. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have a question from uh, the Zoom? Uh, oh, just so the last thing about 
about animation, it's hard to understand. This means you use uh, essentially simplicial uh, resolutions, like in the definition of the cotangent complex. So this uh, kind of assume somehow implicit. I mean, you need the property that if you have a simplicial resolution of something in QSIN, then all this, uh, again, is uh, you can compute using the resolution. Your, I mean, the, the total yes. complex when you apply the resolution is, so uh, so this uh, is this. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, it's not complete. I mean, uh, uh, like yeah. for cohomology, yeah. it is not. It is not. I mean, if you do something like a tal cohomology, then this. I mean, since you always can use the resolution via fine spaces, all of them are cyclic for a tal cohomology. I mean, so it doesn't seem to to behave well for. Right. So yeah. So thank you. So in fact, this, there's something to check here. So, um, so okay. So 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 the way of this way of setting it up is that you first define it on QRSP rings, uh, sort of just by hand. Then by descent, you define it on all quasi-syntomic rings. We could even say p-torsion-free quasi-syntomic rings. And then there's something one has to check, which is that, uh, well, a subclass of quasi-syntomic rings are the like p-completions of polynomial rings. And then the claim is that this, this construction on all quasi syntomic rings is left con extended from those p-complete polynomial rings that one checks. Uh, well, for example, it's in the Butlery uh, APC paper. Um, and that, I guess that's, that there's something to check because when you take these prismatic, the prismatic complexes, they're not quite left con extended in this sense because of the iotic completion involved. Um, so there's some sort of cancellation that one has to check to, uh, to, to ensure that this is a good definition. Okay, we have another question from Zoom. Uh, Hi, uh, I mean, as you wrote different de definition before, I mean, you define this uh, syntomic uh, commodity as some kind of the eigen space of some, some, of, uh, of some file. Uh, I mean, I, I remember that the, for the orangi uh, original motivated commodity, there's also, Rationally, there is isomorphism as a as a eigen space of the other operator. So, so I wonder if there's some connection of this this phi and the atom operator in more classical terms. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I think that's a great question. Um, I'm not completely sure what the direct connection is um, because this is somehow the prismatic Frobenius, not the atoms operations. Um, and it's the well, it's a Frobenius on the, the prismatic cohomology. And actually it's not also in this case by, by powers of P, it's by powers of the ideal. So I, I think it's an interesting parallel, but I'm not quite sure of a precise statement here. Okay. So I, I mean, mean I it's a precise statement of characteristic P, I guess. Or no, there's some notion of the power, power operator. I mean, I think in, in, in Lurie's he's is the yeah he has some 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 system or mechanism on this but yeah I'm not sure. yeah Thanks. so I think it does work in characteristic P kind of as you said because uh, again it'll be sort of up to isogeny that but the thing is that yeah that will be sort of up to isogeny because I think when you define the motivic complexes in that way as sort of eigenspaces of say Frobenius on on, on K theory it's it's sort of up to isogeny. But I think, yeah, sorry. So I think in characteristic P, at least it is sort of parallel, but maybe, maybe up to isogeny.